It's great to be here, and I want to echo everything that Dave said with uh, respect to thanking everyone with the MGA and also Steve Fenmore and everyone at Alpine. You know, we really appreciate everyone's attendance here today. I think if you leave here, you'll at least be satisfied. That was a great breakfast, and I'm looking forward to lunch already. <laughs> so we'll get started with maintenance guidelines. Uh, again, crucial document to prioritize course conditions and management practices. You know, golf course conditions vary extremely widely from one course to another, and as a result, course comparisons occur, and that's pretty much human nature. I don't think that's going away, uh, despite our best efforts to try to explain why uh, it's unfair to compare courses. Uh, so instead, let's try to think about what it is about golf courses that we like and why we like those certain conditions that we define as, as you know, good conditions. You know, is it smooth greens, is it fast greens, firm fairways, well manicured, consistent bunkers? Um, is there really a one single right answer that makes a well-conditioned golf course? I have my opinions, but they could be vastly different than yours, so uh, it, it's kind of challenging to think about. And at, from the USGA standpoint, we get asked this question a lot. Well, someone has their idea of a well-maintained golf course and they want to find out, are there certain standards that we should be doing in our golf course to make sure we're getting a well-maintained course? Is there a standard as to how often greens should be mowed, or bunkers raked, or fairways mowed, things like that? And the simple answer basically is no, there aren't any set standard for these types of maintenance procedures. Because every golf course is different, you guys know that. And each golf course, because it's different and unique, requires different management programs for that particular golf course. When you think of all the factors that are involved that affect course maintenance, and conditions, it's really no surprise that we don't have these types of standards. <coughs> Budget and staff size really are the two biggest players when it comes to course conditions and overall maintenance practices. Climate plays a major role. Soils and grass species also dictate an awful lot of what we do on our golf courses. The topography or the size of the property that we're managing. Uh, you know, in the Northeast, a lot of the golf courses are pretty tightly packed and, and you know, maybe on 150 to 200 acres. You go further south where there may be golf courses on a development community and they're spread over four or five hundred acres. Big difference on how those golf courses are maintained if they have the same amount of uh, money to use to uh, set up some, some programs. <coughs> the architectural design of the golf course, construction methods, the microclimates that a particular golf course has, all these things impact what we do to improve our golf course maintenance programs and they all then determine uh, ultimately the conditions that we can maintain our golf courses. So with all these variables, again, it's not a surprise why we just can't produce a cookie cutter set of maintenance guidelines that work for everybody. And again, it further justifies why we can't compare one course to another, even though I, I realize that's probably something that is just human nature and it's tough to, to not do. Uh, ultimately though, the more you ask your golfers about what kind of conditions they're looking for, the better idea you're gonna have of what they want. And this is something that I do at just what every turf advisor service visit that I make each year, uh, or that I make to each course each year. I start asking the question, well, what exactly is it that you're looking for from a condition standpoint? And it really depends on who you ask, right? Uh, you know, if you ask the guy on the left here, he's a single digit player, he wants championship conditions, green speeds are all in 12. And if you ask, you know, maybe a female player or a, a player that doesn't hit the ball very far, it's utilizing the forward tees, you know, that's where they want their focus to be directed towards. And somewhere stuck in the middle is a superintendent, just trying to figure out how they can keep turf alive, number one, and then number two, how can they please this huge faction of golfers that they have at their membership. It's really pretty challenging to do. Different people just have different expectations, and so trying to figure out which expectations to meet are really challenging. And then every golf course is going to have that faction of golfers that really just have unrealistic expectations, that want the Oakmont type conditions but really don't have you know, a tenth of the, of the maintenance budget to support those types of conditions. Then on the flip side, you get a small portion of your golfers that are just happy to play golf. You know, the conditions aren't as important. They're trying to get some exercise. They're really just enjoying the game. And ultimately, it boils down to figuring out what the majority of the members want and how much you're willing to pay. This picture is one of my favorites. It's Beth Page Black, and this was taken probably in the mid-90s before a lot of resources were infused into the golf course in preparation for the U.S. Open. And that bunker looks more like, you know, a beach on the Jersey Shore than, than it does an actual bunker, but the place was packed. 
you know, the golfers were happy before all the renovations and they're really happy now. So again, it kind of dictates what it is your golfers want. And you need to align yourself appropriately with the budget that you have and your, your golfer's expectations. If there's a huge discrepancy or big gap between those two, some portion of your golfers are going to be unhappy. It might not be a big portion, but we're, we're not in the, in the business to, you know, have angry golfers. We're in the clientele business ultimately. So we need to make sure we keep as many people happy as possible. You know, businesses have really long recognized the value of these detailed business plans so they know what their employees are, know their employees' goals and the objectives of their company. And again, golf courses really are no different. We might not be trying to make money in every scenario, although there are golf courses out there that are in the profit business. But we can't afford to anger a certain part of our golfing clientele. And that's really where maintenance guidelines come in because they align ourselves up as best we can with understanding what our golfers want and how we can best give them uh, those conditions. If you don't have maintenance guidelines, which I'm sure there's plenty of people already in the audience that have these guidelines, but it's important to realize even if you have them already, it's a great time to revisit them because committees change and personnel change that might dictate some of these things. But if you don't have them or they've been kind of sitting on the shelf for a few years, it's a great time to revisit them. If you don't have them, Basically, the golf course takes on the persona of the superintendent based on their personal philosophy of maintaining golf course conditions and healthy turf. And oftentimes, that's dictated by you know, what they hear, comments from typically the vocal uh, members at your golf course that you know, don't always speak for the majority of the membership in, in most cases. It might be the same thing from a general manager's standpoint. They hear those same vocal golfers and they're telling the superintendent, well, this is what we need to do. We need to please this group of golfers. And ultimately, that leads to a lot of challenging scenarios. Again, the superintendent is pulled in too many different directions. And when you have a lack of a common goal, you don't have a clear definition of what your golfers want with respect to golf course conditions, somebody suffers, and it's usually the superintendent first. I'm sure people have felt like this before, where you're just taking arrows and bullets uh, in every, every which direction. But ultimately, the golf course suffers too. There's probably programs that the golf course needs that maybe are being deferred or there's, they're just not being performed because the golfers uh, haven't communicated exactly what they want and what they're looking for to get out of that golf course from a conditioning standpoint. So why are maintenance guidelines needed? Again, I think I pretty much covered that already. Really important to just align yourself as best you can with the available budget you have with realistic expectations of your memberships, but they really just identify your maintenance priorities on the golf course. You help really clarify the expectations of your memberships, and again, you're always going to have a faction that has unrealistic expectations, but maintenance guidelines help define those expectations and sort of broaden them and, and get them <coughs> as close to uniform as possible, which then leads to, you know, just make better budgetary decisions know exactly where you should be spending your money, or at least you have a much better idea of it. Um, certainly, you create some continuity within the golf course. Uh, this is something that is sometimes challenging, especially at uh, golf clubs that have uh, a lot of committees and frequent turnover. And I'll share a quick example with you. Uh, my first year on staff, I visited a golf course, and the green committee was predominantly made up of single-digit players, really good players. They like the fairways cut pretty low, uh, right around the three-tenths of an inch. And you know that's okay. We can do it. You know that's what that's what our committee wants. Then three or four years later, basically a change over in that committee, and who's on now? High handicap players. Well, they don't like the fairways cut that low. They they wanted them above a half an inch. So I'll point the mowing height. These changes are not all that common, and I'm guessing it's things that have happened to some of your golf courses already. And with frequent turnover in committees, it leads to these types of issues. And this is not anything new. Uh, golf course architect by the name of Alistair McKenzie, who I'm guessing many of you know and have heard of, uh, designed Augusta National, Cypress Point, many others. He hit the nail on the head back in the 1920s when he wrote this statement. It goes something like this. The history of most golf clubs is that a committee is appointed, they make mistakes, and just as they're beginning to learn by these mistakes, they resign from office and are replaced by others who still make who make, who make still greater mistakes, and so it goes on. And I know this has happened at your golf courses. Maybe not everyone, and it might not have been that big of a deal when it has happened. But because some of the short changeover in some of these committees, 
you lose some continuity with what your overall theme is for maintaining golf course conditions. And that's where maintenance guidelines really play a role in that as they define what the majority of the membership is looking for out of expectations and conditioning and it avoids some of those constant changeovers. Maintenance guidelines are also a good obstacle for ill-advised changes and I know this one has happened at some of your golf courses as well where you get a new committee and they kind of want to play architect a little bit. Uh, leave their imprint on the golf course, maybe make some changes that directly impact their game. You know, let's take all the trees out of the right side because I hit a ball left to right and if I'm in the rough I want to have a clear shot at the green. Adding a bunker here and there. These things do happen. Uh, so it's important to have sort of a checks and balances type of system in here. No doubt at some point on your golf courses architectural changes may be necessary but maintenance guidelines can help you make these decisions and changes in a sound manner where it's going to fit in with the long-term goal of the overall club and, and you can avoid some of those random tree plantings or just bunkers popping up here or there, you know, that kind of thing. The guidelines are also a really helpful tool when dealing with complaints. You know, it's impossible to please everyone. I'm just now realizing that. Um, you know, it seems like I um, always pleased people before, but people are getting more angry at me, I guess. Um, but the maintenance guidelines can really help deal with some of these complaints that they're always going to be there. Complaints are just, again, part of human nature. But for a particular complaint, you can look at it and say, well, I'm listening to your complaint, but based on the maintenance guidelines and what we had in place, our superintendent is you know, executing the plan according to what we've set forth. It, it doesn't, again, it doesn't eliminate those complaints, but it's a better way to handle some of those complaints, and it takes some of the pressure off the superintendent in a lot of cases. So who determines the guidelines? It's really a collection of, of groups, um, and it's got to be a cooperative effort in this scenario. The Green Committee or the owners should certainly be a part, the golf course superintendent, golf professional, and general manager. All these parties are involved because everyone has key uh, aspects that need to be heard with defining these guidelines. The role of the Green Committee, first and foremost, is really to define the overall expectations. It's their golf course. They're the voice for the membership. And the best way to do that is to start with some sort of a membership survey, solicit some input from golfers of all abilities, not just one faction, the better players, the high handicap players, you got to get information from everyone. Also take into consideration what are some unique characteristics with their particular golf course. You know, they'll impact certain its programs. What's the annual budget? What's the tournament schedule? Do you have outings every single week that add challenge to maintaining the golf course? And after all these things are sort of analyzed, they can kind of put their best foot forward and try to define what kind of conditions and expectations they want. The committee defines the golf course conditions. The superintendent then works to develop plans to meet those expectations. Golf professional plays a major role in these uh, developing the guidelines as well. In particularly, they add input as to how certain changes might impact the, all the golfers abilities that play the golf course they should also discuss if there's any changes within the maintenance philosophy in those maintenance guidelines and how that might impact pace of play and a prime example here is you know sometimes it sounds like a good idea to have three and a half inch rough well if you're a better player that doesn't have too much issue hitting a golf ball out of three and a half inch rough no big deal but for the majority of golfers out there that's going to add a lot of time to your round of golf uh, and finally, golf professionals probably hear or have most contact with golfers. So they should pass on, you know, complaints and compliments. It's not just the complaints, although sometimes it's typically what we remember most, uh, to the superintendent because that gives them an idea of, okay, you know, nothing but compliments on the tees. We're doing a pretty good job there, but people are unhappy with the bunkers. Maybe we need to focus more efforts towards our bunkers to overall satisfy our membership. General manager should really partake in all these discussions as well, really to provide an overview as how the golf course operating budget fits in, fits in with the entire facility plan. Um, again, they're going to have a really good understanding of all the budgets that are available at different different departments, and be able to make changes where necessary if suddenly the golf course needs a greater amount of resources to work with. And, and they also hear a fair amount of uh, membership or golfer comments and complaints as well that they can pass the information along. Finally, the superintendent really plays the most important role with developing these maintenance guidelines. Again, it's the committee that defines the expectations. The superintendent's role is then to fit those expectations and develop a management program 
that can produce those types of conditions. And that's pretty challenging because you've got to try to fit in the desires of the committee with some agronomic realities. And it's always kind of a give and take when you're developing these programs, but it's possible. And the reason why the superintendent plays the biggest role is because they've got the best knowledge base for the entire golf course infrastructure. They understand the equipment, the infrastructure issues like drainage, the irrigation system, typical employee turnover, and budgetary issues that have been you know, a problem in the past or maybe things that need to be worked on. Uh, but then they need to develop a program that will then work with those expectations. And essentially, to do that, once they get the information from the committee as to what kind of conditions they want, they start thinking, okay, I've got to develop a budget that can accomplish these tasks. And once that budget is done in its preliminary budget, then everyone gets back together in a group and, and you start talking about it. And it's usually a pretty eye-opening experience where you get all these groups together and they start thinking, this is what we want condition-wise. Superintendent says, well, this is what it's going to cost. And Rarely are the two numbers anywhere close to each other. And usually the expectations are, are just too far out and the budget is it's too big of a jump to, to meet all these expectations. And so there's a compromise. I haven't seen a case where, okay, these are the expectations, we need an extra three or four hundred thousand dollars to accomplish this and okay, no problem. There's usually a compromise. But the point is with this compromise it gets everything in line as best as possible with reasonable expectations on course conditions and the available budget that the golf course has. Uh, one thing to just keep in mind with these guidelines too is it's a working document. It's never really complete. There's a checks and balances built in where it can't be changed overnight necessarily, but it can make some adjustments here or there. Again, I mentioned earlier, if you have these, it's probably a good time to at least take a look at them and see has your golf course population changed? You know, do your golfers want something new where maybe you need to make some adjustments? The key really is you list the day-to-day -day maintenance programs and you kind of move from there. You gotta be realistic with some of these things and be flexible. Um, it's not, it's really not fair to say we're gonna maintain our greens um, at a green speed of 12 every day no matter what. It's just not realistic. Mother Nature just isn't gonna allow that and that might not be the right thing for your golf course. Uh, have brief descriptions on these things generally. Uh, the more descriptions you have doesn't necessarily mean that that's a better thing and with maintenance guidelines. Keep it simple. Uh, they should be readable for, readable for non-turf people. So I just want to share with you a few sample items that I would guess most that have these already have these items on there. Uh, maintenance guidelines and, and for those that have yet to create them, these are always some, some key things to keep in mind for the maintenance guidelines. Mowing practices, mowing you know, impacts probably playability. Uh, the single most out of all the cultural programs we do, so you've got to define these different areas uh, with respect to greens, tees, fairways, roughs, intermediate roughs, collars, approaches, just sort of defining all these areas, what they are, the manner hours it's necessary to maintain them, how often you're going to mow them, what equipment is necessary to maintain them in an ideal situation, what kind of labor is needed to maintain them. And then you can even go as far as to define some mowing heights and the key with this is it's got to be a range of mowing heights that's sustainable long term. That you're not killing your grass because you're maintaining it too low, but you're also meeting the playability requirements that your golfers want. And that's going to be different for everyone. It's, it's, it's kind of depending upon again, what your expectations are and what your golfers really want out of their golf course. Just wanted to share this quick image for you with some of the non-turf people. Uh, kind of threw a, a mowing height out there for a putting green of 0.12 inches, which is just below an eighth of an inch. That's a fairly common green speed or um, mowing height. Uh, some people might be lower than that, some people might be a touch higher. But just wanted to put it in perspective for you. I don't think many people have putting greens in their backyard, but they have rough in their backyard so they can visualize that. That height of cut is two dimes stacked on top of each other. That's pretty low. So when you see your superintendent in late July and early August looking a little tired and a little stressed, just think back to the fact that it's two dimes stack on top of each other. That's where we're at with our putting green conditions right now. So we make it look too easy in a lot of scenarios about maintaining healthy putting green turf. It's a lot harder than it looks. So other, other things to include on the maintenance guidelines, cultivation programs are definitely one to focus on because you know they're often one of the most disliked out of all the uh, management programs on your golf course seems to happen right when the greens are getting good. Um, but it's important to put this information on there and at least explain 
the frequency that they're going to be performed and the timing that they're going to be performed. If golfers understand a little bit about why you're doing these programs and when you're doing them, they're going to at least know what to expect when you know the iterator comes out and, and when greens are being top dressed, that kind of thing. Uh, you don't need to go into too much detail with this program in particular. Again, just enough to give them some information as to why you're doing it. Now, pipe green speed is another really important one to include on the maintenance guidelines, and I say that mainly because it's really such a hot topic that often gets discussed in the uh, 19th hole. Generally, I think golf courses go about determining their green speed in the wrong fashion. You start throwing out numbers first and say, okay, we want we want 11 or we want 12 because we know that's good. And, you know, that's a fast green speed and that's, that's what we want. That might work for your golf course, but it's better to do something a little bit more sustainable and think about it from a turf health standpoint. Okay, what, what does it take for us to maintain our greens and keep them healthy throughout the summer months, especially when it gets really stressful? What's that mowing height? What are our rolling inputs where we're not going to lose our greens overnight? What's sustainable for our golf course? And then from there, you start looking at what is that green speed as well? How does that tie in? And the key with this is you've got to make sure that that green speed and that mowing height is in line with your golf course putting greens based on the slopes that you have and based on the amount of play that you have. If you've got a lot of slopes and you get a lot of play, your greens essentially shrink in size because you just don't have the same amount of hole locations. So you're going to get more traffic and that can lead to a lot of problems long term. So definitely one to keep in there. Uh, I would develop it as a range of green speed, somewhere between uh, you know, a foot in you know, plus or minus, uh, because golfers never can really tell the difference between six inches on a stint meter, and rarely can they tell the difference between a foot on the stint meter. So instead of saying we want the green speeds at 10, it's better to say we want our green speeds to be between nine and a half and 10 and a half. That way, if you meet the range, you meet the range. You don't have to say our greens are 10 2 today. You can simply say, you know, we, we're meeting our goal today. Um, definitely with green speed though, this is where you need to build in a caveat or a safety net. Uh, if there's anything that I think most people have learned over the past two years is that pushing for green speed under ridiculously stressful summer conditions is not worth it. You might get good green speed for a couple days, but you might suffer for dead greens for, you know, two months. So it's just not worth it in this scenario. There's got to be a checks and balances there. Irrigation programming is really important to have in the guidelines as well. This is really I think it boils down to agronomics versus playability here. Uh, the superintendent has to know what is acceptable at your golf course. How are you irrigating the turf? Are you irrigating it for lush green conditions from wall to wall? Or are you irrigating it to have the best playability possible? Because you can't do both. There's no way of getting around that fact. If you want lush green conditions, that goes against pretty much every agronomic principle that's in the book. But if that's what your golfers want, that's what they want. And you know, that's what your superintendent's going to have to do. You're going to be more predisposed to problems. But as soon as your superintendent at least knows on what side to err on, hopefully on the dry end, then they can go forward and put out some better programs. If a little bit of off-color turf is acceptable, it just it gives them a better understanding of sort of their job security. You know, if I lose a little bit of grass or if it's a little bit off-color, that's okay. We're getting the playability that we want versus lush green turf. Bunker maintenance, another big one to include. I visit a lot of golf courses and I feel like I've heard just about every complaint about bunkers, but it's a new year, so I'm sure there'll be a few new ones here or there, and I think it all stems to the fact that we just aren't very good bunker players, myself included. Um, so good one to include in the maintenance guidelines to help handle some complaints. In addition to just talking about raking frequency and how often you're gonna edge the, the, uh, the grass around the bunkers, things like that, add some more detail here. How often are you going to add new sand to the bunkers? What's your desired playability? Do you want them to be relatively firm, or do you want them to be kind of soft? Uh, also, maybe thinking about uh, what it takes to maintain sort of a consistent depth within the bunkers. A lot of things that you could add with this section, and again, this is one because there are so many complaints, might be one to put a little bit more detail in. <clears throat> tree maintenance program, definitely key to have this in the maintenance guidelines. Discussion here should focus on why trees need to be removed, the basics sunlight and airflow. Turf can't grow without those two factors. Uh, also talking about pruning frequency and why that's done. And then in the rare situation that you might need to plant a tree, we'll talk about some of the reasons why you selected a certain species or you've got a list of species that work for your golf course and making sure that they're not going to be planted in the wrong place. 
What's your golf cart policy? Definitely want to have in there. This is uh, all too true for a lot of golf courses, I know it. And personally, I think seeing golf cart damage is one of the most disheartening things that I get to see you know, on a fairly frequent basis because it just kind of tells me that the golfers don't care. And that's not the case. They're just so focused on getting from point A to point B that they don't realize they're driving through a foot of mud. Um, so defining in the maintenance guidelines why you need to have restrictions at various times throughout the golf course or throughout the year is really important there. So I just wanted to share just a quick example of one of the maintenance guidelines. We've got a lot in our office. This is uh, the best digital version that I have, which is why it's from Portland, Oregon, and not from uh, the Northeast. So if anyone has a good digital version, I'll update this. Um, but just wanted to share this quickly with you guys to just show you what, what some people have created. First and foremost, they start with a table of contents. It's got clearly defined areas, so you don't have to read through the whole thing. You can quickly go to parts that are of more interest to you. Uh, it starts out with club history and the mission statement. This is really neat, not for everyone necessarily, but it's important for the superintendent to have a good knowledge base, for, for everyone that's involved with creating these maintenance guidelines, to have a good knowledge base of what the club was initially started as and what's the mission. Are you sticking with that mission or are you making some changes? Uh, then it goes into course description and layout, has a whole by whole basis. Uh, the, old layout, the whole layout has some key features like rain shelters, that kind of thing. Uh, then it gets into the maintenance programs, and this is just one example. They've got a lot of maintenance programs on there, but this particular one is the intermediate rough. It talks about how often it's going to be maintained, why it's there to begin with, um, to, to create some definition, uh, because they maintain their rough pretty high at this particular golf course, so an intermediate rough is appropriate. It talks about the equipment that's necessary to maintain it, the man hours required to maintain it on a weekly basis, the replacement cost of that equipment, which is usually pretty eye-opening, um, and then again, long term, what their plans are if some of this equipment uh, fails. And it touches on some employee training and some specialized equipment that is used throughout the golf course at various times. And then it ends with the budgeting process, which is pretty neat. A lot of times, golfers just don't have a clue how much money you're working with and where that money's going. You give them a little bit of information as far as the budgeting process, and it's it's going to take home a, a pretty good message, I think, for a lot of out of your golfers, especially when you compare it with maybe five-year trends of what's going on in your golf course. Some of the conditions change and they see the budget's been dropped the past five years, it, it, you know, a light bulb might go off with some of your golfers. Uh, and ultimately everyone benefits from these maintenance guidelines. You know, the green community, the golf professional, and the general manager all benefit because they get a better clue as to what it takes to maintain the golf course on a daily basis. The membership benefits because they finally get the conditions that they've been looking for that, you know, again, maybe you were hitting the nail on the head and you were getting those conditions, but probably, you know, there's areas where you, some of your members weren't completely satisfied. And this is where these maintenance guidelines really help out. Superintendent benefits because they've got clear objectives. They know what is expected of them and they can sort of evaluate themselves and their programs long term. And then finally, you just you have the best checks and balances system for your budget. You know your budget's being spent as appropriately as possible because you have a clear definition of what everyone wants. So with that, appreciate everyone's attendance, and uh, you'll see me uh, again in about an hour and a half. Questions? Yes, sir. Do you have any sample for guidelines available that we might be able to access? We do. Golf, uh, many golf clubs in the area have given us those uh, their samples and they've said we can then share them with golf clubs so uh, we can discuss it afterwards I can give you my card and, and we can get you a number of examples that we have in our in our office yes yeah I think it's probably important to do that especially for clubs that have really specialized tournaments where it's important to, you know, enhance the overall conditioning or the challenge of the golf course for those for those tournaments. Probably really important for green speed, things like that, where again you want to have that system in place where you want to produce, you know, maybe more intensified conditions, but still have it be reasonable and, and not not worry about turf failing on you. So I would have some some factor in there. It kind of depends on how many tournaments you have in there though. Um, but yeah, it's probably a good idea. Yes? Is it really possible to get bunkers consistent around the whole? No. Uh, I can go into further detail if you need me to, but 
We've got other presentations. <laughs> yes, no, it's not. Hopefully that was recording me too. very successful at getting that information out on the telecast and, and mainly because the advertising dollars are just incredible and it's it's really tough to do that from our standpoint that's something that everyone on staff would love to do but we have done over the past two years is do more of these short videos that are accessible on the website at usopen.com that talk about some of these things that we do and why the championship conditions at the US Open are what they are versus regular play. Um, you know, with respect to the bunker comment, things like that, we would love to do that as a staff, and we certainly talk about that on turf advisor service visits, but it just hasn't been something we've been able to get accomplished on those telecasts. It's, it's kind of out of our hands, but I think everyone in the green section would love to have that time slot, uh, but it just it hasn't happened yet, unfortunately. Yes, sir. Well, the firm and fast is is a really neat concept, but it's those two words have caught on. What it takes to produce firm and fast has not been as widely publicized. And from the Northeast region in particular, anytime we're in front of an audience, we're trying to at least explain what it takes for those conditions. A lot of times, it doesn't necessarily save you money. It might be agronomically a better route to go, but it's very challenging to do that. We, we focused some of our efforts on writing more articles and we're trying to do more webcasts, things like that to get the message out because again, conceptually, I think we're all in agreement that Firm and Fast really has a good place. That's, that's really what the, golf, the game of golf started as, but it's very hard to achieve that. It's not as simple as just turning the water off. So we're continuing to do as much education. Anytime again, we're in a group like this, there where we can talk about it, we're trying to at least explain it. But it's those two words mainly of what's caught on firm and fast and not it's fun to talk about that it's not as entertaining to talk about all the resources and efforts that it takes to, to create that at your golf course all right thank you very much